It's great to be here today. And uh, Brother Corey, I, I thank you for the, the invitation. And I am very humbled. Uh, 126 years. And I was trying to think of stories. I even pulled down. I still have old directories uh, from years gone by. And I pulled some of those out. And I was looking through pictures. And I was thinking of stories. And I thought, oh my goodness, if I start telling stories, we'll never get to the word and we'll never get to lunch. And uh, I don't want to miss lunch. Um, been looking forward to being here and seeing everybody and fellowshipping together, being with you in worship. And honestly, I could have just said, man, what a blessing. Let's go home. When these little ones stood up here and sang for us this morning at the opening of the service, it just blessed my heart. Brother Jeff was trying to make sure that I didn't preach too long by singing all those fast-paced bass line songs today so that I would lose my breath. <laughs> thought I was going to hyperventilate down there, but... Um, it's been great. Some of you will understand this, and I thought about it this morning, and I wish I'd have remembered, because instead of shirt and tie, I could have wore my Denny's shirt and brought my Denny's cup. Um, we still have some folks who have a sense of humor, and they blessed me a couple years ago with some Denny's gifts. And if you don't know the Denny's story, it wasn't one of my uh, most uh, banner moments as a youth pastor. Um, we're all human. I know Brother Tom Malone never, never lost his cool in front of any of his people before, but uh, that night at the National was, was rough, and we decided we was going to eat at Denny's, or I decided, under duress, <laughs> only to turn around and see where we're going back to the room when we weren't eating at Denny's after all. And so, anyhow, what were you doing 126 years ago? Yeah, me too. What a blessing, and what a heritage. And uh, what an opportunity for us to pass it on to another generation. Um, as we were singing, this is just a, a no charge, but as we were singing, my mind went to Revelation chapter 21 and 22, and I just want to read it <laughs> because it's homecoming, and there's a greater homecoming that's awaiting us. In, in Revelation 21, and this is not my text, but anyhow, free of charge. And I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away every, all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death. And that's one thing that stood out to me, is the numbers who have gone on and are waiting for us to join them. They're already there. There's going to be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I hope you're not too comfortable with these things here, because these are the former things, and they're going to pass away when the new things are brought in by Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to that day. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And then it goes on, and if I keep reading, I'll have to change my text. But I look forward to that day. As much as I've been looking forward to just being here to see each of you, and I know I'm new to some of you, some of you don't know me, and, and I look forward to, to getting acquainted today if we have the opportunity. If not, I hope we have the chance to get acquainted over there. I remember reading after one pastor who had grown his church to be rather large, and it was a church that had gone to multiple services and they were continuing to reach people in their community and someone who was critical. And I know it's hard to believe that anybody in the church would ever be critical of anything. They went to that pastor and they said, there's no way that you know everybody in your congregation. And he responded and said, Christ's commission did not require me to know everybody. Christ's commission told me to go and tell everybody. I'm going to have all eternity to get to know them if I don't get to know them on this side of heaven. Now, that may be a little extreme, but 
I do look forward to getting to know some folks who I haven't had the privilege of getting to know. I get, I'm looking forward to getting to know some folks who I've never known, but they've given their life for the cause of Christ in recent days in other parts of the world. Our brothers and sisters who have far more faith than I've had the opportunity to exhibit, but who stood and looked death in the face, and rather than choose life, they chose Christ. And I'm proud to be part of that family who stands for the Lord, even in the midst of the hardest circumstances. And I look forward to meeting my brothers and sisters in Christ one day. I had all these things written out about when I was here and my wife and I and the time we've spent, and let's just say we're blessed. You all took a, a minister, a young minister who had visions of grandeur and who was wet behind the ears and you, you coupled me up with an ex-Marine who was uh, a stickler for details. He's not here. He called me this morning, Brother Barry. And uh, I was thinking, though, there couldn't be a, a better matchup. Um, Brother Barry helped me with the things you don't learn when you go to school. And uh, you all were cooperative and worked with me and was patient with me as the Lord developed me into the man of God and the minister of God that he wanted me to become. And I, try, I, even, I even polished my shoes <laughs> for Brother Barry, thinking he was going to be here. So if you see him, <laughs> tell him he doesn't have the marine gloss. But, but uh, I told my wife once a year where they need it or not, right? And what better occasion? <laughs> I blame Brother Barry and my wife. They teamed up against me. I wasn't a coffee drinker until I came to New Hope. My wife loves coffee, and when we were in that, that wing that's now the children's wing, and that was the sanctuary, my office was the big office, and everyone thought that was just like, why is the pastor giving you the big office? Because my office had the photocopier and had all the paper that everybody needed, and in that office was also the coffee pot. And every morning I would come into to, to the office, and, and Brother Barry already had coffee brewing, and I loved the smell. I mean, but, and it was in my office, and I had to sit there and smell it all morning, and finally I broke down, and I thought, well, I'll just drink a cup. And then before long, he mentioned something along the lines of, we may have to get a, a, a collection up here if we keep drinking this coffee like this. Uh, and so he had won me over uh, between his coffee drinking and my wife's coffee drinking, and, and I, I think of, of Brother Barker. And uh, one of the things that, that stand out to me about Brother Barker, and there's a lot of things, but I just will never forget the times that he would stand up in front of either our senior citizens group or this church, and he would just say, join me. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good, he's so good to me. Has God been good to you this week? Amen. Precious memories. And I could go on, as I said, so many more. I'm just going to skip ahead. We're very forgetful people. That's humanity. And I don't know if it's just that we forget or if we're just distracted. Sometimes I think we're too busy and we're distracted. And the further we, we are removed from an event or occasion, the less likely it is that that occasion will continue to have an impact on our lives. So just a little more participation this morning, okay? I've got three, three quotes or three sayings that I want you to complete for me in regards to things that we have promised to remember, that we have promised not to forget. And so the first one is remember the, remember the what? Sabbath day. Sabbath day. You're all are more spiritual than me. Remember the Alamo. <laughs> but don't forget the Sabbath day either. <laughs> remember the Alamo. This is going somewhere. 
Now that you're on the same wavelength as me, December 7th, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. September 11th, 2001, we will never forget. We will never forget. It's interesting to me as I, I recall those sayings that are tied to our nation and significant events in our nation, and they're not the only ones, and, and I know they're not all this way, but it's interesting that they're commemorating when bad things happened. And I know why, because of loss of life. I understand that. It's the value of life. And, but we have a lot of things that commemorate when basically bad things happen. Not that we don't have some that commemorate good things, but those were the first things that came to mind, and maybe that's just something wrong with me. I, I don't know. But uh, this morning, as we look at this passage, and it's going to be in Joshua chapter 4. I know you thought we'd never get there. I want us to look at a situation and a circumstance where God encourages to remember things that are good. And that's kind of what homecoming's about, isn't it? To remember the blessings of God, the goodness of God, the things that have brought us here, and the fellowship that we have. And in Joshua chapter 4, just want to read the first seven verses, and we'll refer to some others as we get into the message, but just to kind of get us going. Joshua 4 verse 1. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan... That the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priests' feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night." Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared out of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean you by these stones? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Now, I know we've jumped kind of in the middle of the story, and, and in Sunday school the last quarter, since everyone goes to the most important hour of the week, right? Sunday school, the most important hour of the week. Um... We touched on the book of Joshua, and so I know you recall from those great lessons taught by your tremendous teachers uh, the story, but just in case you were asleep that day or you missed it because of a trip to the beach or mountains or something, God is moving his people forward. When we come to Joshua chapter 4, God is moving his people forward, and it's history in the making. This is a huge, huge occurrence in Joshua chapter 1, Joshua has been placed in command because Moses has died. And Joshua has been told to be strong and courageous and of good faith and to trust in the never failing God. In Joshua chapter 2, the two spies are sent out to spy out the lands, especially the city of Jericho. Very, very key in their, in their strategic plan as God directed them. And as they were spying out the land, as they were there, they received confirmation from Rahab's faith. Rahab had a testimony of faith that the Lord was moving in the city of Jericho. That the Lord was stirring hearts. Basically, he was stirring fear because they were fearful of this group that was on the other side of the Jordan at the time. This group called Israel, the children of Israel. And Rahab's testimony was such that God had given the land to Israel. That it was their land. Interesting, uh, a prostitute, uh, a, a non-believer had the faith that God was going to do this, and so much more, so much so, it converted her life. Reminds us that God brings us from all sorts of backgrounds when he calls us into faith with him. Chapter 3, Joshua prepares the people to follow God in faith across the Jordan River. 
And as you read through uh, the story in chapter 3, that's when the actual event takes place. God parts the Jordan River as the priests with the Ark of the Covenant as they step down into the river. And as when they hit into the river, the Jordan River parts. And the priests stand in the middle of the river on dry ground. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. It's a momentous occasion. A momentous miracle of the mighty God. And there's some who try to, to, to work their way around and say there was an earthquake and there was this stuff that happened and made the water split. And how do you describe the dry ground? How do you describe that they stood as if it had been sun parched and baked in the driest days of August? And so they stood on dry ground and the river parted wide enough to let some one and a half to two million people cross over. Anybody go to the game this weekend? Anybody like driving through the traffic that's associated with the games? How many, how many does this Titan Stadium hold these days? If they let it fill up? 75, 80,000? Close? Danny, you're a numbers guy. Am I, am I, you don't know? Okay. 68? Should have went to the leaf. 68,000. Anybody avoid downtown Nashville when the Titans are in town? That's just 68,000 people, folks. Can you imagine a million and a half plus crossing the river? I got frustrated coming from Pleasant View to exit 31 because there were two semis on the interstate and they didn't know which one was going to drive faster. I said, this is ridiculous. You'd think you was in Dallas, Texas the way the traffic is. Then I had to pray, Lord, forgive me. I got to preach this morning. Patience, patience. Should have let my wife drive down here. But it was a historic occasion. As they crossed over, and here's what happened. It, it was a reminder of what God did for them when they crossed the Red Sea to escape the bondage of Egypt, when God delivered them from Egypt. It was marking the end of 40 years of wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. When they finally are getting to step foot into the land God had promised them. And so a new generation's faithful obedience is honored by the presence and the power of Almighty God as they step into God prom God's promised promise and his promised land. Here's the thing. Faithful obedience to God will always move us forward in his plan. Faithful obedience God, to God will always move us forward in his plan. And God's still working his plan. His plan hasn't stopped. His plan's not been interrupted. I guess that's why I wanted to read Revelation 21. That's his plan. And nothing's going to keep that plan from taking place. As a matter of fact, if you're watching closely, you see things falling into place to bring the things about to make Revelation 21 come to fruition. Faithful obedience to God will always move us forward in his plan. His plan's moving. I want to be a part of it. How about you? I want to be involved in it. I like what Warren Wearsby said. He said, we will never stand still in the Christian life. We will either move forward in faith or we will go backward in unbelief. God's plan is moving forward. Our obedience moves us forward with him. And so what we see taking place in the text we read in, in, in Joshua chapter 4, after they had crossed the river Jordan, Joshua had already selected 12 men at God's command. You see that alluded to in Joshua 3. Now he's circling back around and telling what the purpose of that selection was. 12 men, one from each tribe. Most likely the elders or the leaders of the tribe um, were instructed to go back into the Jordan River. Now... This is just me being me, and for those who don't know me, I apologize to offend you, but um, if I was one of those 12 guys, I would say, hold it, wait a minute. I remember what happened at the Red Sea after all of Israel crossed over. And you want me to do what? Do you all remember what happened after everybody crossed over? 
The doctor said, hey, you 12, I know we're all across, but you 12, go back in to the river. I guess it's okay as long as the priest and the ark's there, right? They gather 12 stones. And they carry those stones to the place of lodging. And we, if you read on, and we won't read on this morning right now, but just, just trust me and you can read it this afternoon if you don't. That place was Gilgal. They went to Gilgal and they lodged that night. And at Gilgal, they did exactly what God had instructed Joshua to do. And Joshua, in this passage here, in, in the first seven verses, instructed these men to do, to bring those stones, uh, according to, one according to each tribe, to shoulder them to the place of lodging. And when they get to the place of lodging, they're going to build a monument it was a monumental miracle that took place, and they're going to build a monument to that miracle, a monument to that act of God, a monument to God as he proclaimed uh, and showed them his power. And so these 12 men did exactly what they were supposed to do because they were going to create this perpetual reminder, something that could stand. And here's the thing. We should be encouraged and we should be educated by our past. Even though it was present for them, they were creating this monument, they were creating this history, historical account, if you will, so that others could be encouraged by the might of God. So others could be educated what God had done to give them this land. You see, I was reminded this week as I was listening to a, a podcast by Frank Turek, Miracles don't happen every day. And I do think God is still in the business of doing miracles. If someone gives their heart to Christ, that's a miracle. If they're forgiven of sin, that's a miracle. And that's directly tied to the work Christ did for us on the cross that we sang about this morning. But just kind of to paraphrase Brother Frank, if miracles happened every day, then miracles would lose their luster. You know? It's a miracle that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, right? But if everybody rose from the dead, then that wouldn't be as, as miraculous. But Jesus rose. And it's something we commemorate. And we know one day we also, if we're not living when he comes to take us away, we will rise as well. Because he's the first fruits of others who will follow but they wanted to give them something to remember what happened, to encourage them in their walk with the Lord. And so they built this monument. They, they built this stack of stones or circle of stones, however it might have looked like, so that others could see what God has done. And here's the thing. They didn't build it to worship the stones. They didn't build it to worship the crossing over the Jordan River. Those were the acts of the past. They didn't worship the acts of the past. They worshiped the God who was the Lord over the past. It was their present at the time, but it became the past. So it wasn't about worshiping the miracle, but it was about worshiping the one who created the miracle, the one who made it happen. And that's what God even says, that all the earth may know, that they may know the God of Israel. And so we don't worship the cross, but we worship the Christ of the cross. We don't, we don't worship the past. We're thankful for the past, but we worship the God of the past, who thankfully is the God of the present, who thankfully is the God of the future. We don't worship the church. We worship the Christ of the church. And we're thankful to be a part of it. And so what I'm saying is, let's continue to make much of God. Let's make much of God so others will be encouraged by what he has done in the past. They'll learn from the past. 
magnifying God to the next generation. Something that stood out to me, and I, I'm tickled that Brother Corey referred to the De Deuteronomy passage uh, in his, his opening remarks, because here we see it again in Joshua chapter 4. In, in verse 6, he goes, You build this monument that it may be a sign among you that when your children ask... Who, who are the children asking? Who are the children asking in that passage? Look at it. When your children ask their fathers, and you say, well, Brother Steve, you're in the King James, their fathers is in italics. That means the translators you know, kind of filled it in, the fill in the blanks. It may not actually be in the original text of the Hebrew. Okay, smart aleck. Turn to verse 21. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask, shall ask their fathers in time to come. No italics. It's in the text. When they shall ask their fathers in time to come. What about those stones? Why are those stones there in, in Gilgal? What, what do you mean by this? Verse 22. Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did the Red Sea which he dried up from before us until we were gone over that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord that it is mighty and that you might fear the Lord your God forever they, uh, they put these stones there so they could teach the next generations of the mighty hand and the mighty power of God to deliver his people and the children are asking their fathers. Never underestimate the influence of the home. I've said this for years and I believe it. As much as I loved being involved in the ministry, granted it would have been a whole lot easier if I didn't have to deal with people, but you know, it kind of comes with the territory. That was a joke. That was an homage of Brother Barry. One thing I learned from Brother Barker, who emphasized to Brother Barry and I both, was don't lose your family to the ministry. And as much as I am part of the ministry, love the ministry, incorporated my family and ministering with me so we were ministering together, and I think that's the key, by the way, I never lost sight that my first mission field was under my own roof. Folks, your first mission field, I know we're called to reach the world, but if we don't reach the home, it's going to be challenging to reach the world. Invest in the children. Invest in the children in your home. And I know we got some gray heads. I was going to say, you know, all you, you folks who were part of the senior citizens movement when I was there, you haven't aged a bit, but you were gray then. You're still gray, so that's fine. <laughs> don't never underestimate the power you have to influence grands or even adoptive grands here in this place. Tell them about the might of God. Make much of God. Share the stories of what God has done for you. Let them hear. To me, one of the saddest testimonies I read in Scripture, read this a little over a week ago in some of my studies, is found in Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it says, well, let me just go back and put context. Verse 6 of Judges 2, when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man to his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnatheres, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. Verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord. 
nor the works which he had done for Israel. And in my Bible, I took a pen and I put, why? Why was there another generation that arose? And that's probably a whole other sermon for another time. But it boils down to some moms and dads and some grandpas failed. The home failed. Let's not let the home fail. And the world will tell you, don't brainwash them. Let them decide on their own. Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen if they decide on their own. We're going to have Judges chapter 2, verse 10 all over again. Because I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been told. I wouldn't be here doing what I do, believing what I believe, if I hadn't learned from someone who had gone down the road ahead of me. Someone who had reached out to me when I was a teenager and said, I would really like for you to go to church with me. And that was an uncle. Prior to the uncle was a babysitter who took us to vacation Bible school faithfully every year because she was a teacher in vacation Bible school and she took all the kids that she sat, she watched to Bible school and I was exposed to the truth of God's word in that setting. Make much of God with everybody, but make much of God especially with young people couple more things and then I'll, I'll wind this down, bring this boat in the harbor. We have the monuments and the memories to encourage and to educate uh, about the past. But one thing that stands out as I think about this, uh, it's not enough to dwell on the past. We have to be engaged in the present. Had the people not done what they were doing when they were presently there, there would be no monument. There would be no commemoration of the miracle that had taken place. And so we have to be engaged. They were involved in what God was doing. What if God had parted the Jordan and they didn't cross? Well, look at that. Well, isn't that the strangest thing you've ever seen? Let's sit here and see how long it lasts. Hold a minute. I got, I got to get this and let the world see this. Would you look at that? They were engaged. They were engaged in what God was doing, and they were engaged to the point that they were a part of what he was doing. They, they, were, they were actively participating, going along with what he's up to. Folks, Christ is still up to something. Christ is still active in this world, and there's people who are coming to know Christ. There's people who are, who, who are still needing to hear the gospel. There's people around us who need to hear that message Jesus saves. And we are called to go and tell them and to see the miraculous, uh, the monumental, miraculous might of God in their life. We have to engage. We have to continue to be engaged in the present. They got to experience the east side of Jordan and then they got to experience the west side of Jordan. And I don't know if I got east and west right for, for here anymore, but anyhow, I think that was more north and south. But anyhow, uh, they got to experience that. Because they were a part. Because they were a part. And if you read through Joshua chapter 3, they were prepared for that. God in Joshua 3 told them to consecrate, to sanctify themselves. Joshua said, sanctify yourselves because tomorrow we move. So they set themselves apart and they sanctified themselves for the move. And then they looked for God to move. They just didn't act upon themselves. Later they're going to act upon themselves and they're going to get in trouble. And they're going to learn real quick. We move when God moves. We move where God is moving. And we do it as a holy people, not an unholy people. Read Joshua chapter 6 on your own and all that will come to light. But they looked for God to move. And so it involves making sure that we are in right standing with God and then watching and waiting for him to direct us in what we're supposed to do and then to trust him when he says move. There's times that we'll feel led to go do something and whew, I don't know. <sighs> if God's telling you to move, move. Move. The children of Israel didn't split the, split the river, did they? One of my pet peeves as I've been in ministry is I would hear people say, Brother Barker say Brother Barry saved me. Brother Steve, you go. Men and women 
can't save anybody. Jesus saves. But we're the vessel being involved in what he's doing. We're the messengers. We're the ones who carry that message. And so we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to make sure that we're where we need to be. Consecration, sanctification must precede conquest before we can move forward. And they were ready and they moved forward and then they made uh, this monument. Just like they saw two sides, if you're here and you've accepted Christ, you've seen two sides. You know what it's like to live in that old sinful life. You know what it's like to be bound by sin, to have those chains of guilt and, and really not being able to control yourself because you're slave and servant to the master. Sin. But if you've accepted Christ and you've come to know him and you're in a relationship with him, you also know what it means to cross over that river and to be set free by the mighty blood of Jesus Christ to be cleansed and to be made clean and to be made uh, holy and to be adopted into the family of God. That's what Christ does for, does for us. And where would you be had you not crossed over into the invitation of accepting Christ? Life would be a whole lot different. What a testimony. What a testimony to share. And so he changes us. He makes us a new creation. We go from stained and cursed with sin to cleansed and blessed. We go from guilty to forgiven. We go from rejected to accepted and adopted into the family of God. We go from focused on and serving self to focused on and serving Christ. He makes us a new creation. One day all things will be made new, but he's already making us new today if we've accepted him. And I hope that's where you find yourself today in that new creation. We're given a new set of standards for living. Christ's passions become our passions. Christ's goals and desires become our goals and desires. I preach this whole message and they got a message I don't, I don't look up. I'm supposed to turn my mic on and I thought it was, but anyhow... My wife says, I don't need a mic. Um, encouraged by the past, engaged in the present, excited for the future. Can you imagine what it was like to be on the shores of Jordan, to see it part, and to know, hey, this is it? How many raise your kids on Veggie Tales? Yeah? I think I knew every VeggieTales song that was ever written, at least during the duration of my kid's childhood. You remember the one where they said, it's time. Did he just say it's time? And they go, sorry, we didn't have a lot of fun in the desert. We didn't have a lot of fun in the sand. Something about pack up your cow or something like that. We're going to the promised land. I can't remember. But the excitement that they must have had knowing here it is. We're finally going to get to experience this thing that, that God has promised us. And we're going to step foot into what he has prepared for us. And they had to engage and participate. They had to take the step. They were going to have to go to the battles. It was, it was not, it's not, a, it's not a parallel to us crossing over into heaven. It's a parallel of taking up arms and fighting the spiritual battle and enjoying the blessings of the victory that come with that battle. Now, part of those blessings for us are what lies ahead. And it should motivate us. We should be excited about what's coming. We should be excited about the fact that the Lord is going to return. That He's gone to prepare a place for us. And for those who believe and who have dedicated themselves to Him and are following after Him, He's come to take us to be where He is. And that invitation's open to anyone who will. And we should be excited about that. And it should motivate us as we engage in what we're doing in the presence. Christ has blessed us with so many great things in the past. Christ continues to bless us with great things today. Each of you who are sitting here, who have accepted Christ, you're a living testimony, a living monument of the mighty and miraculous working of God.
Do you want to be a part of what he's continuing to do? Devote yourself to Christ. Be encouraged by what he has done in your life in the past. Be engaged in what he's doing today. And be excited about what the future holds.